the first thing that they point out is, here's all this information they provide, okay? Here's how far apart the particles are, so, or their starting points are, rather. Here's um, what we're going to use for gravity today. Here's your first particle's details. They don't tell you the velocity of the second particle. That's because the question is you've got to work it out. And then they tell you, okay, at some point these particles are actually going to collide, which means I can use this result that I just went to all the effort to prove last time. So I'm going to put a box around that and um, put a star on it because then I can use it, okay? By the way, you do not have to, obviously, you don't have to arrange it like this, but I like to do something like it, particularly when you've got lots of information flying around, so that number one, you can categorize it. This is all the stuff about particle one. This is all the stuff about particle two, etc. And um, you don't lose track of all the millions of equations flying around. Okay, let's begin to solve. The first thing they want us to do, part one, is work out <laughs> what is, if the particles do really collide, what is the velocity, the starting velocity of the second particle? And secondly, I think it's when do they collide? I think that's the question, okay? So, have a look at everything we've got on the board. What would you like me to do to try and find V2? That's the starting velocity of the second part. Where would you like me to go? Yeah, good. In part A, we went to ahead and prove this. We've been given V1, theta1, and theta2. So V2 is the last thing left there. So this is an obvious choice, okay? So I can say, um, since the particles collide, I'm going to quote this and I'm going to pop all the numbers that I know. I'm going to stick them in. So here we go. 30 sine of this. Um, I don't know what V2 is. And then I'm going to do sine of that. Okay. Now what? <laughs> I'm just going to um, evaluate everything. What is sine inverse? Sine of sine inverse of four fifths? It's just four fifths. Uh, by the way, when we were doing inverse trig, we had to do all this kind of fussing around when we said, oh, when you have sine of sine inverse of something, it's not always something, you know, we had to be careful with that domain here. Why don't I have to worry about that in this particular? Why can't I just say four fifths? Okay, the domain has been restricted because this is a number, it's not a variable, right? So I don't have to worry about, oh, sine of sine inverse of x is x sometimes. It's like, look, I've got a, I don't have a sometimes, I've got an actual number in there. You can just chuck that into your calculator if you really wanted to. It's just a number. In the same way, I've got v2 over here times 3 fifths. And if you solve, you rearrange, divide through, multiply through, you're going to get 4. The second part was, okay, well, when does this happen? When are they actually going to collide? Now, I'm looking for, in other words, I'm looking for capital T. Remember I defined that? I said, okay, let's just define, let's just say there's some time T where it happens and these are the equations that I created, okay? Now, in order to solve for capital T, solve for capital T, that's what I'm after. You remember we used this equation in order to find V2, right? So therefore, what seems to be the logical choice if what I'm trying to solve for now is capital T, where are you going to go? I've only got one equation that has capital T left in it, right? Have a look, it's there on the board. It's this guy. It's this one that we couldn't use before because I didn't know the distance between the two particles. So you could do nothing to resolve this, right? But now I know, now I know. So I'm gonna come back to this in the same way that I did it right here. And I'm going to evaluate everything here and I should end up with these capital T's being the things I need to solve for. Okay, so you ready? Hold on to let's do some substitution, right? Since the particle could collide, I'm just going on with the same line of argument. Not only is this, is is this true, which is everything vertical, okay? That red box over there, that is also true because of what's happening horizontally, okay? So I know all of these pieces, let's have a go. V1 is 30, I don't know what T is, so I'm gonna write that down. And then I've got cos of this angle again, right? So I'm just gonna substitute it in before I bother evaluating it. That's the left-hand side. Okay, the right-hand side, I know the value of AB now, I know its magnitude, so that's my 200 distance between the two. And then I subtract, okay, I know what V2 is now, I just worked it out a line ago, so 40T cos of, and then there's this slightly different angle. Okay, excellent. Now, you have a look at this, we had a look at questions like this right back early when we had to do some um, 
inverse trees and like expansions and that kind of thing. Have a look at this guy, which we want to try and resolve. Okay, sine inverse of four and five. Sine inverse of four and five. This is an angle, and it's in, it inhabits a particular right angle triangle, right? And in fact, because you have a look, this is opposite on hypotenuse, right? You could draw a diagram, but come on, we're extension one students. We know what the last side in this triangle is, right? It's clearly going to be three. So this is 30t times, this is just the other pair of sides. The adjacent side, which you just told me, is going to be three, and there's the hypotenuse. Does that make sense? If you get to this point and either you have messier numbers or you're just, okay, I'm in an exam panic, I don't trust my own instincts, just go ahead, draw the triangle, it's fine, and you'll find what that last side is. That's the left-hand side. Tell me what's right on the right-hand side. Okay, yeah, you've actually already evaluated it, right? So this, in fact, inhabits the same triangle, it's just I'm looking at a different angle. So this is going to be four fifths. Okay. Now, what was I trying to do again? What am I doing with this? Yeah, I'm solving for t, yeah? So I just have to tidy this up a tiny bit. Uh, what's 3 fifths of 30? Come on, 3 fifths of 30. 18. It's 18, right? 18. Me can do numbers, okay? 4 fifths of 40? 32. So this is 200 take away 32. Okay, you have a look. How many t's are you going to get on that left-hand side? That's going to be 50, right? So there you go, I have a time of collision after exactly four seconds. That's kind of neat, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I asked some of you before, well, the people who were here in the room, um, to have a look at the rest of this question. For the rest of you who aren't quite there yet, what we want to do is, and this is question 13 in exercise 3G. We want to therefore work out, okay, we know when they collide. I want to know where they collide. So where is this vertically happening? How far above? <coughs> How far above this horizontal axis am I? Like, where am I? And secondly, I'll, I'll read this for you and you can steal away on it. The second question is, what is the obtuse angle that's formed between the two particles when they collide? Okay, so this is kind of just a little variation. We can work out impact angle and speed, but now I've got two things hitting each other, right? So the angle between them is not going to be measured from the horizontal. They're going to be measured between the two particles. Okay, so this is where we're going to finish. Right, so first thing, remember I said we just worked out where the when the particles collide. So how am I going to work out where they happen vertically? What am I going to do with this time equals 4? I want to know where above the axis, so it's clearly a vertical thing I'm interested in. Yeah. Now, thankfully for me, I don't have to choose between either of these two equations because if they're colliding, they should be the same, right? So therefore, I've got some space over here. Let's continue. So this is part two. When t equals four, because now I actually have a value for this. Choose whichever one you want. They're both the same. I'm going to go for y1. So I've got a value for gravity. So this is going to be minus a half times 10 times 16. This is four squared, right? So 16. Good. I've got a value there. And then I've got all this other business over here, right? So I actually know what all these things are. They're already on the board, right? Didn't I work this out? Where is V1 T sine theta 1? Or even just V1 sine theta 1? Where did I work it out? X1 has a bit of an energy because they're in the room. It was here, right? Do you remember? Do you remember? Where did this line come from? This line came from V1 sine theta 1, V2 sine theta 2. So that right there, which means that right there is V1. Yeah? Uh, sorry, V1 sine theta 1. So I'm going to pop that in. That's 4 fifths of 30, which is 24. 24, right? So this is what? Plus 24 uh, times 4, because I actually have the particular time, right? Okay, can you go ahead, help me out? What have I got here? Did that do my new do my do my Yeah, does it look okay? This is 160, right? You halved it? Yes? 4 lots of 24? It's one lot of 4 less than 25 lots of 4? Yeah, okay. Okay, you got calculators, it's fine. <laughs> what does it mean? What have I got? 60. Okay, can we interpret that? Where's this happening? This is this is 16 meters above whatever my ground level was. Okay, so there I am. Now 
As you said, for all kinds of motion, whether it's straight line motion, simple harmonic, or projectile, it's important you go from numbers and actually make a statement. So I'm going to say, therefore, collision occurs 16 decimal, right? Wrong? Mm -hmm. I think it's got two dots. It occurs 16 meters above this ground level, which we've defined, of, they've defined, rather, as AB. 